Hello everyone. Welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for June 2018. Thank you for joining our presentation this month. Our presenter today is Jackie Whitaker. Among her many roles as an internationally recognized physiotherapist, Dr. Whitaker is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Therapy, uh, Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine, and Research Director of the Glenn Sather Sports Medicine Clinic at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. Her research aims to understand the origins of chronic musculoskeletal diseases, such as osteoarthritis, that we typically see in adults, but uh, in youth populations. Her research looks specifically at the period between youth musculoskeletal injury and the onset of osteoarthritis, and the development and implementation of targeted secondary prevention interventions aimed at reducing the burden of osteoarthritis. Dr. Whitaker has presented a webinar for the Alliance before, and we're thrilled to have her back. So welcome, Dr. Whitaker. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Um, I would also just like to start by thanking you guys for giving me this opportunity. Um, I know that what I've been asked to do is to share a presentation that I gave as a plenary talk at the World Congress on Osteoarthritis earlier this year in Liverpool, and that talk was on secondary prevention of osteoarthritis after joint injury. So as we all know, the burden of osteoarthritis is enormous and it's expanding at an alarming rate. And despite the growing prevalence and burden on healthcare systems, we currently don't have a cure. Given that there is no cure, the only way that we can really go about reducing the burden of this disease is to shift our approach to management upstream and focus on prevention. Now prevention can take on many forms. Strategies, strategies aimed at preventing or reducing risk factors in susceptible populations are typically referred to as primary prevention. Those aimed at identifying and slowing down the onset of symptomatic osteoarthritis in preclinical populations fall under the umbrella of secondary prevention. And then strategies concerned with improving function and reducing disability and those that already have osteoarthritis are grouped as tertiary prevention. In the context of joint injury, Primary prevention would refer to strategies aimed at preventing joint injuries in susceptible populations, such as individuals that play sport. Secondary prevention would refer to strategies aimed at delaying or halting the onset of osteoarthritis after joint injury. And then tertiary prevention would be all about trying to improve function in those that have developed osteoarthritis having had a joint injury. Currently, we have a pretty good understanding of what needs to be done from a primary and a tertiary prevention perspective. However, there are not a lot of studies that have, been, that have spanned this entire period between joint injury and osteoarthritis onset. And as a result, we don't really have a lot of guidance for what we need to be doing from a secondary prevention perspective. So keeping that in mind, what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to first present a framework for implementing secondary prevention of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, building off a model that exists already in the field of sport injury prevention answer the question, who's at greatest risk of osteoarthritis after joint injury and what can we do about it based on the best evidence that we have and what we've learned from the fields of primary and tertiary prevention. And then finally, I just want to end with a couple of considerations of things that we're going to have to keep in mind as we move forward and take on the challenge of, post, uh, of secondary prevention of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So the prevailing model or framework that underlies the field of sport injury prevention is the six stage trip or translating research into injury prevention practice model. And although it was developed to facilitate the prevention of sport injuries, which you will recall from my earlier slide equates to primary prevention of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, I believe that it can also be adapted to secondary prevention as well. In this context, the first step in secondary prevention of post-traumatic osteoarthritis would focus on understanding the extent to which people develop osteoarthritis after a joint injury. The second stage would aim to identify risk factors and causal mechanisms for post-traumatic osteoarthritis, which would then inform the development of secondary prevention strategies. Stages four through six would be focused on assessing whether or not a prevention program can reduce the onset of osteoarthritis after joint injury under ideal scientific conditions, understanding the implementation context for secondary prevention programs, and then ultimately determining if the prevention program can reduce the incidence of osteoarthritis in those that have had a joint injury in a real world context. The two stages that are most relevant for my talk today are stages two and three. So let's talk a little bit about how we would identify risk factors. 
in, a, in an ideal setting, if we wanted to determine if something was a risk factor for osteoarthritis after a joint injury, we would likely conduct what we call a prospective cohort study. This would mean that we would take a group of individuals with and without our exposure variable, which in this case is joint injury. We would measure the risk factor or risk factors of interest, and then we'd follow these two groups of people forward into some point into the future and determine how many of them in each group actually went on to develop osteoarthritis. We would then perform some sort of statistical analyses to determine if and how the potential risk factors influence the relationship between joint injury and osteoarthritis onset. Now in theory that sounds pretty straightforward and fairly simple, however it isn't, and, and likely one of the largest challenges that we face in designing this ideal study is the length of follow-up needed given that it may take anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 years before the onset of osteoarthritis after a joint injury. Other challenges include having commonly agreed upon diagnostics for post-traumatic osteoarthritis, accounting for the multifactorial nature of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, as well as the fact that the majority of people that develop post-traumatic osteoarthritis are young, having sustained their joint injury under the age of 25, and many of these individuals are still undergoing physiological maturation and are at a dynamic point in their life where there may be many other contributing factors that may influence whether or not they develop osteoarthritis. Solutions that have been used to address these challenges, including following persons for various lengths of time from injury, using some sort of a surrogate outcome, such as a knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome score, or MRI defined OA or quality of life, or an interim outcome, such as re-injury or return to sport. We've also used um, tried to find ways to combine data sets to increase our sample size to enable those multivariate analyses through multi-site and international collaborations. And then to deal with this natural life course and all the confounding variables that come from that, typically we try to incorporate an uninjured comparison group. Although there are very few studies that have been done using this textbook approach, there has actually been a fair amount of work done in this space. There are a lot of prospective studies, but there's also a good number of retrospective studies that have involved secondary data analysis. Most don't span the entire time frame from joint injury to osteoarthritis onset, but some do. A very high proportion um, involve young individuals that have torn their anterior cruciate ligament and, and had it reconstructed. Few, unfortunately, have incorporated uninjured comparison groups. And as you might imagine, there's been a diversity of potential risk factors for post-traumatic osteoarthritis that have been considered. Some of these studies have been focused on understanding the extent to which joint injury leads to osteoarthritis. And they've really been focused on non-modifiable risk factors such as age, sex, and injury type. These studies have been essential to our understanding of the increased risk of developing osteoarthritis after an ACL tear, an ACL reconstruction, or a combination of knee injuries. However, there's also been a lot of studies that have been done that have focused on potentially modifiable risk factors. And although the quality and the level of supporting evidence varies across each of these, I would suggest that there are some common threads across studies that are consistent to what we see in the clinic and what we know regarding primary and tertiary prevention that not, not only point to who's at the greatest risk of developing post-traumatic osteoarthritis, but to treatment targets. Given the urgent need that we have to reduce the growing burden of osteoarthritis, I think there is an argument to be made for starting to shift towards the development and the evaluation of secondary prevention programs based on the treatment targets with the most supporting evidence. Now to highlight some of these common threads, I'd like to introduce you to an ongoing longitudinal cohort study that I've had the opportunity to co-lead over the last several years. This study, which we refer to as the Prevention of Early OA or Pre-OA study, started with 100 youth and young adults that suffered a sport-related intraarticular knee injury three to 10 years previously when they were under the age of 18, and then 100 uninjured controls that are matched on age, sex, and sport and we followed these individuals for the last three years. Recently, we've been in the process of adding another 100 individuals that have suffered a, a youth sport-related knee injury, this time within the last three months, as well as an additional 100 matched uninjured controls, whom we plan to follow for the first three years following their injury to help answer some of the questions that have arisen from the first wave of participants.
It's very important to point out that the definition of knee injury used across this cohort has not been confined to an ACL tear and that we've included participants with a variety of other knee injuries. In following the first wave of participants, so those three to 10 years out from injury, on a wide variety of variables, we've made some novel observations while building on some key themes that already existed in the literature. For instance, by including a variety of knee injuries, we've observed that structural changes consistent with future osteoarthritis are not unique to knees with ACL tears and meniscal lesions. With that being said, however, the odds of MRI defined away, which is our surrogate outcome, do vary by injury history, the type of injury, and whether or not a participant's had surgery. With those having had more severe or combined injuries in surgery, having the greatest odds for MRI to find OA. By including participants at various lengths of time from injury, we've identified that previously injured participants score lower, indicating poorer outcome on all five subscales of the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome score, which is a patient reported outcome measure to assess self-reported symptoms and functions. So over the next few slides, I'm going to show you a series of plots based on predicted values from best fit models that included a bare minimum time since injury and sex. The outcome of interest um, in this case, which is the Coos symptom subscale, will be on the vertical axis and time since injury will be across the bottom. Females will be represented by green lines, males by black. Previously injured participants will have broken lines and the controls will have solid lines. So for instance, what you can see on this slide is that the Coos symptom subscale scores do not differ by sex, but in those previously injured, the lower the scores were lower, the further they were from their injury. We've also observed that previously injured participants have weaker knee extensors than uninjured controls, and that this varies by sex and the further the participant was from injury, with females the furthest away from injury demonstrating the weakest knee extensors. We've shown a similar pattern for the knee flexor strength, although time since injury was less of a factor here. Using a triple single leg hop test, we've observed that the dynamic balance of these people varies by sex, and for the previously injured participants, performance on this task diminishes the further they are from injury. One of the more troubling observations was that previously injured participants have greater fat mass index, which varies by sex and time from injury. Given that obesity is a known risk factor for osteoarthritis, this observation suggests that some of the participants in the previously injured group may actually have a compounded risk for osteoarthritis due to the amount of adipose tissue that they have. To add to this concern was the observation that previously injured participants were two times more likely to be in the lowest quartile for self-reported physical activity and that physical activity decreased the greater the time from injury. And then the last thing that I just want to touch on quickly are findings from interviews aimed at assessing beliefs related to sport, injury, and osteoarthritis. There were four main themes that emerged from this work, acceptance, resiliency and determination, knee confidence, and athletic identity. These patients reported varying and at times unrealistic degrees of acceptance regarding the impact of their injury on sporting ability and future risk for osteoarthritis. Many were highly motivated to recover and, and meet the injury with resilience, and as a result, they reported not always pacing themselves well. Most reported a reduction in knee confidence and an evolution of their so-called athletic identity since their injury, and, and that that had been impacted both by the injury itself as well as other life experiences. So starting with the findings of the pre-OA study and then looking to the evidence base, I think we can quite easily start to construct a profile of who's at greatest risk of osteoarthritis after joint injury. First of all, I think we can all agree that there is overwhelming evidence that those who suffer an ACL tear, especially if it's in combination with a meniscal or an osteochondral lesion, are at a very high risk of osteoarthritis. It goes without saying then that re-injury, which is a significant issue after an ACL tear and is associated with worse five-year outcomes, will also increase the risk of osteoarthritis. And as there is a clear link between meet, meeting return to sport criteria and risk of re-injury, it seems reasonable to assume that an individual who returns to sport after an injury that does not meet return to sport criteria 
are likely at a high risk of future injury and subsequent osteoarthritis. Following joint injury, the most accepted risk factor for osteoarthritis is obesity, which contributes to the development of knee OA through both systemic and mechanical mechanisms. The lifetime risk of osteoarthritis increases with increasing BMI, and beyond the findings from the pre-OA study, there is also evidence that young female athletes gain more fat mass in the one year following an ACL injury compared to their uninjured teammates. Although the link between physical activity and osteoarthritis onset is not as well established after a joint injury as some of the previous risk factors, approximately 8% of youth who have a sport injury do drop out of sport. 20% of those that tear their ACL um, return to, do not return to sport. And those that undergo an ACL reconstruction spend less time in moderate to vigorous physical activity and have lower step counts than uninjured controls. There's also evidence that a proportion of youth that suffer a sport-related knee injury may become disengaged from their sport. Consequently, it is likely that inactivity is a risky behavior that may contribute to the development of osteoarthritis after a joint injury. With respect to muscle strength, meta-analyses tell us that the odds of developing symptomatic osteoarthritis was about 1.7 times greater for persons with weaker knee extensors than stronger extensors. And recent work from a tertiary prevention perspective has shown that knee extensor strength gains mediate pain and physical function improvements in patients with knee osteoarthritis. Beyond the knee extensors, there is emerging evidence that the knee, that strength of the knee flexors, and let's face it, likely other lower extremity muscles, which just haven't been looked at yet, are important for preventing re-injury and performing functional movements, and accordingly muscle weakness, and maybe poor performance on functional tasks should be considered a risk factor for knee osteoarthritis. From a clinical perspective, there's evidence that prehabilitation and early exercise therapy for those undergoing an ACL reconstruction are associated with better two-year function. There's also emerging evidence that fewer symptoms and fear of movement at baseline or six months are associated with better long-term consequences. Finally, there is cross-sectional evidence that individuals that have undergone an ACL reconstruction in the past and now have osteoarthritis have poorer knee confidence and a greater amount of fear of movement than those that have undergone an ACL reconstruction in the past and don't have osteoarthritis. Consequently, it is possible that individuals that have had insufficient rehabilitation or have more symptoms and greater fear of movement may be at a higher risk of osteoarthritis. And then this brings us to a set of other potential risk factors associated with patients' knowledge and beliefs regarding how to interpret and manage flare-ups, how to pace their activity levels, and a variety of other subjects. A survey of patients undergoing ACL reconstruction identified that many of these participants have inappropriate beliefs regarding their ability to return to sport after surgery and future osteoarthritis risk. For example, 91% expect to return to sport by the, at the same level by one year post-surgery, when we know in reality that that number is closer to 65%. Further, only 2% thought that they had an increased risk for future osteoarthritis, when we would estimate this to be much more like 50%. There's also a well-established body of evidence that unrealistic patient expectations can lead to negative outcomes, and therefore it's likely that a lack of knowledge and inappropriate beliefs may also have a place in this at-risk profile. Finally, I just want to touch on nutrition, given that certain micronutrients have previously been shown to have an integral role in joint and bone health. Preliminary data from 40 participants in the second wave of the pre-OA study at the time of injury is showing that alarmingly few of them meet recommended dietary guidelines for vitamin D, K, or calcium intake. Further, there is evidence from the Osteoarthritis Initiative database showing a higher prevalence of symptomatic radiographic osteoarthritis in persons with a high dietary inflammatory index, indicating a more pro-inflammatory diet. Therefore, it is plausible, although more work is required, that micronutrient deficiency and a high dietary inflammatory index may also be risky behaviors in the context of joint injury and future osteoarthritis. So given this risk profile, what would a secondary prevention program look like if we wanted to take action right now? So based on what we know from primary and tertiary prevention, I don't think it's going to be really shocking to very many people when I say that we're likely looking at some combination of exercise therapy and education. 
From an exercise perspective, obviously knee extension strength, as well as the strength and capacity of the remaining leg and trunk muscles is going to be vital. With that said, strength alone is likely not going to be enough as it's critical that these patients can perform functional tasks that are relevant and important to them, whether that be in the context of their lifestyle, sport or occupation. I think a key component to this exercise program is going to be dealing with fear of movement through confronting provocative movements and myths regarding weight bearing and joint loading. Finally, it's critical that any exercise therapy program promote or better yet incorporate recommended levels of physical activity. From an education perspective, it's going to be critical to provide patients with information that allows them to develop realistic expectations regarding return to sport, re-injury and osteoarthritis risk within the context of the severity of their injury. This will likely mean having to help them to let go of some unrealistic expectations that they've picked up from other sources along the way. Another important piece is balance, balancing their needs to meet their, um, balancing their needs for physical activity, rehabilitation and sport while pacing and managing flare ups. It will likely be important to discuss how to avoid re-injury and the importance of return to sport criteria. And if there is a need to modify a patient's physical activity or sport, it will be critical to work with them to understand what their preferences are as we make those changes. Finally, there's an important piece related to weight management and diet. Targets might include micronutrient supplementation, caloric intake, and then reducing that dietary inflammatory index. Now, I think there's also a third essential element to this intervention, and I've termed it for a lack of a better word, provider approach. And what I'm trying to get at here is the philosophy underlying a healthcare provider's approach to patients with acute knee injuries. This philosophy needs to be one of co-management where we're willing to have the difficult conversations while balancing the need for realistic expectations without over-medicalizing the situation. We also have to be willing to challenge our default approach to treatment and embrace exercise therapy as the first line treatment. That doesn't mean that exercise therapy is going to be the only form of treatment, um, but it should be the first treatment and it should be done adequately before we move on in, in a lot of cases to the next stage. Um, and I know there are exceptions to that as well. The best way to deal with any problem is to avoid it. So the earlier and more individualized one approach can be to minimizing the onset of, of risk factors that may compound the risk for osteoarthritis after injury, such as a gain in adiposity, the better. A final key piece to this philosophy is to never forget that the long-term goal here is lifelong musculoskeletal health and mobility, which may or may not involve return to sport at a pre-injury level, and it may or may not return, involve return to sport promptly. It may take some time. So we've talked about who's at the greatest risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis and what a prevention strategy might look like. I just want to finish with a few thoughts about things that we might need to consider as we move on to testing and implementing secondary prevention strategies. I think that it's very important for us to learn from those that have come before us in the fields of primary and tertiary prevention. We're going to have to eventually down the road combine data from a variety of different intervention studies in a meta-analysis to show that these approaches work. And as a result, it's really important that at this point in time, we agree upon things like surrogate outcomes and definitions um, for certain outcomes and common methods to measure them to facilitate these future meta-analyses. With respect to implementation context, it's important to realize that patients' needs will vary by injury type, injury age, and time since injury. Therefore, our approaches will need to be flexible and adaptable. In addition, we need to keep in mind that this patient population is young and adherence to exercise therapy in youth is notoriously poor. Interventions will need to be accessible, social, and focus on developing self-efficacy. It's also likely based on what we know in the field of youth physical activity interventions that different approaches may be needed and, and taken for different genders. Finally, we must remember that knowing what to do and getting people to do it are not the same thing. The one thing that can be guaranteed is that if we leave implementation to lighter, it will be challenging, if not impossible, for us to do it. If secondary prevention of post-traumatic osteoarthritis is a challenge that you want to take on, I would really encourage you to include an implementation scientist on your team now. Employ frameworks such as the REAIM framework 
and, and ultimately to, to, to ultimately improve the adoption of the intervention you come with, up with. And then probably most importantly is consider consulting patients and clinicians and actually involving them in your research now. So I'm just going to finish there by acknowledging all of my co-investigators, our research coordinators, trainees, all the funding that we've received for this, this cohort study, as well as, as acknowledge all of those that have contributed to the information that I've drawn from for this presentation. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, but if there are, I would be certainly happy to, uh, to uh, try to answer them right now. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. That's a fascinating um, presentation. I so appreciate all the research that you're doing to look into secondary prevention, which I feel like is is um, a growing, rapidly growing field and one that we don't at the Alliance spend as much time on. We focus a lot on primary prevention for injury, um, looking at different training strategies that athletes can take part in and, and reduce the risk of the initial injury, and then of course tertiary prevention when folks already have osteoarthritis, then how can they manage it? But this secondary phase is fascinating to me, and I think it's such an important area to get people back to a state of functionality or to reduce the risks like you've described. Um, when we, just taking a look at um, all of the kind of key risk factors that you listed, I appreciate that they all play a role, including physical activity and increased adiposity post-injury and, um, and certainly the behavioral issues. I'm, I'm curious about the, the knee extensor strength and flexor strength and what are the realistic expectations for regaining that strength in someone who, say it's sort of the ideal situation if somebody actually um, undertakes rehabilitation appropriately and they have the right mindset and all of the things, all the right boxes are checked off. Um, you know, the tissue has been damaged. How can, how, what would you expect is the um, ability to recover 100 percent or, um, you know, is there always going to be that room for risk and, and further damage? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, the answer to the question realistically is that it, it, it's going to be individual and it'll it'll depend on the type of injury and, the, and if they've had surgery, the type of surgery they've had. You know, if they've had their ACL reconstructed, was that done with a patellar tendon or a hamstring or an allograft or something else? Um, I think the key here is that probably the, the kind of key things are this, is that I think you should always, the goal of, of the, the team that's helping the person recover and then maintain um, their 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 health as well as the patient is that they optimize their knee extensor strength and they keep it optimized for years and years and years and years to come. And so it isn't about can you get it back to you know within 80% or or sorry within 10% or something of the other leg. I think that's very important and, and that plays a role maybe in making the decision about starting to have a graduated return to sport. But in my experience clinically is that people can gain it back and they can get pretty close 15, you know, 10, 15% of the other leg and they can start to return back to the activities that they want. But it does appear over time if they don't maintain the strength that they can start to lose it again. And I think that that's actually what we showed a little bit in our pre-OA study. You know, what we saw was that for the injured participants, the further they were away from injury, the weaker their knee extensors were. And um, that tells me that, okay, yep, maybe the work's being done up front when they're going through their acute rehab or their post-surgical rehab, um, but three, four, six, ten years later, they're weaker in those muscles. And we know undoubtedly there's plenty, I think, of very high level quality of evidence to show us that that is going to uh, potentially be part of the mechanism of why they go on to develop the disease and probably also the rate at which osteoarthritis itself worsens. Um, we know that we can mitigate some of the, the pain and some of the functional loss in patients that have osteoarthritis by improving their knee extensor strength. So I do think the knee strength extensors are a critical part of it. I do believe other muscles probably play an important role as well. We just haven't investigated them. Um, and, you know, I mean, the ultimate answer to your question is it is going to be individual, but I think it needs to be from day one a priority, and we need to really work with patients to stress the importance of gaining that strength, but not only gaining it, maintaining it. And, you know, literally that may mean that they're doing strengthening exercises for their quadriceps for the rest of their lives. And those strengthening exercises are likely not going to be sufficient um, with sort of 
you know, kind of really basic low level home exercises, they're probably going to need some resistance. Um, and there may be ways that we can we can help them to do that at home, but it may also require, you know, going to the gym and, and, and using exercise equipment. Well, and one of the things that we talk about in, in some of our injury prevention work that is more looking at primary prevention, you touched on with this idea that rehabilitation becomes a lifelong thing. You know, when, you're, when we're communicating our message to youth athletes or young adults, uh, you know, those folks, I guess rightfully, we're all sort of invincible, aren't really thinking 10, 20, 30 years down the line. They're, they're thinking about today, tomorrow, perhaps getting back in the game, perhaps being uh, afraid, like you said, to, to re-engage. So um, yeah, I think the patient education part is just as important as the actual rehabilitation so that people understand <laughs> what the long-term uh, consequences could be or, or might be if they do or don't um, continue with training. Kind yeah, of I agree, to the, the, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say you raised a really important point there, and I think, you know, I've been involved in a fair amount of the primary prevention as well, and, you know, we're starting to see evidence that, you know, we get better uptake when we talk about these primary prevention programs being more about improving performance and, um, you know, addressing some of the more apparent and obvious needs of the coaches and the players, and I think we're going to run into a very similar situation with secondary prevention. I can tell you from the kids that, you know, and the youth that we've got in our studies, me talking to them about, you know, trying to prevent future osteoarthritis is, is of little to no interest to them. It does resonate with the odd one of them, but for the majority of them, it's, it's, it's irrelevant and their priorities and their goals are very different. And that's why I sort of in my last couple of slides said that I think it's going to be critical to have these kids involved in the design of these secondary prevention programs because they're going to have to approach this issue from a perspective that's important to them. And it's probably going to be more related to, yep, return to their sport or a different sport or fun, or it's, it's going to have to meet some need that they have. It's not going to be about, in their mind, preventing future disease, because I don't think we'll get the buy-in we want. Right, right. Yeah, and in some cases, you might get the buy-in from parents, but even, even parents may be thinking about the, the now and the near future as well. So I think that's certainly key. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate all that you're doing with this program. And, and you know, much of what you focused on was um, the, the education from the patient perspective and their need for better information, which is absolutely true. I was pleased to see that you had also on there some information for providers and what they can do to help facilitate uh, rehabilitation, either directly themselves or by educating their patients. Um, how do you see the, where the gaps in knowledge are? Do you feel, from your perspective, did, have you um, interviewed any providers, or do you feel like perhaps athletic trainers are on board with this, but we need to focus on physical therapists, or uh, where, where, what are your thoughts are on um, provider education? So, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in, you know, one profession owns one aspect of this. I think that it, everybody's got to be involved. I think that there's a role for everyone. And I, I think the most important thing is we need to have consistent messages and consi consistent messaging to these people. And, and we're a long way from that. So I don't see secondary prevention falling in the realm of any one profession. I, I, I do think that there's a role for everybody. But I, but I do think that, you know, there's going to be different professions or different individuals that will, that will have interactions at different points, right? And I think, um, you know, I do, I really think that with that being said, what's going to be really important is for everyone to keep in mind what our long-term goal here is. And, and the reality is sometimes it's not, you know, I mean, if these kids are, you know, let's say I, I can think of some, you know, somebody who's performing at, a, you know, at almost a national level and it has an opportunity you know, potentially to represent their country at a national, international competition or at the Olympics, um, their focus is not the same as, as somebody else's and the team they have around them is not the same. And, um, you know, the, the decision making process isn't the same. And, you know, right now we've got, as, I, as I've said, I think we've got a lot of gaps in knowledge related to what we need to do from a secondary prevention perspective. I mean, a lot of what I've presented has really been, you know, teased out of this article and out of that article and out of this article. And, and somebody could probably turn around and say, hey, you've missed some things. Why aren't you talking about biomechanics? Or, you know, you might have, you know, you've presented just one side of the story for physical activity or, or you know, uh, dietary inflammatory index. You haven't presented the other side. 
And so I, I think that, you know, I've, I've pulled together a, a profile of things that I think are helpful for patients and for practitioners to think about um, as they deal with these patients. But I think there's a lot of work to done and uh, to be done. And I think probably the biggest amount of work is, you know, we've got to start trying to develop and implement and, and evaluate these programs. And it's going to be challenging because if the if the outcome of interest is osteoarthritis onset, um, we're talking about, you know, a good gap in time from when we would implement this program to knowing when it actually worked. And so I think we're going to have to come up with some commonly agreed upon surrogate outcomes, earlier outcomes. And I think there's, there's, there's pockets around the world where people are starting to do this now. Um, but I do, I see this as an area of growing interest and it does. I mean, I'm a physiotherapist and I think it, it fell, this, this falls into my lap and resonates with me because I am already treating these patients. The problem is I'm really just treating them from the perspective of their acute injury or their recovery from surgery to when they feel fairly pain free and have full range of motion and good strength and they go back to doing what they want. And then I don't, I don't really hear from them until they're 15, 20 years older and they've got the beginnings of osteoarthritis in their joint. And I think there's a huge opportunity in that period of time. And that probably isn't the realm of a physiotherapist. That probably is the realm of a, you know, somebody that's doing more strength and conditioning or an athletic therapist that's working with a team or a phys ed teacher, or there's a variety of different people that might fall into that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an area that's ripe for, for more knowledge, but it's an area that's going to be very, very multidisciplinary. Um, but the key is, I think, going to be the key messages and, the, and the consistent messages. Very good. I agree. And I, we certainly have our work cut out for us, whether it's somebody like you on the research side of things or us on the public health side or certainly the clinical side. I, I appreciate all of your insight and, and uh, willingness to, to try to crack this nut a little further. So thank you very much for your presentation today. Again, very interesting. I appreciate your time. Sure, no worries. I really appreciate it. And if anybody hears this and they have a question, feel free to find my email and send me an email, and I'm happy to answer any questions that others might have. And likewise, you can email the Action Alliance, and we'll pass 